Welcome to another episode of Reading Rhetoric and Retweets, where today Elle and I talk about a multitude of things from James Summerton to Ethan Klein to book talk drama to Finster and the concept of being gender fluid online and how sexuality works as a creator and a multitude of other things, along with some giggles and some perhaps audacious comparisons between Eden Paradise Lost and Skylar White, but you have to tune in to see, and I hope you enjoy the episode. I like to film these little intros before. Let me know too if this is cool with y'all or if you want just to go straight into it, but anyway, I hope you enjoy the episode and comment down below what you'd like to see next. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everyone, to Reading Rhetoric and Retweets, because we haven't figured out a new name yet. Also, also, thank y'all for the kind comments, specifically the gassing up L1s. We want more of those. By we, I mean me specifically. Uh, They have not asked me any favors, (laughs) I promise. Uh, (laughs) I also want to welcome topic suggestions for this more intimate audience kind of vibe uh, via my email down below or my dms or anything or the comments themselves obviously the comment section l will also see directly because she checks them i will see them also obviously also also on the top of the morning per the recent or for the oncoming St. Patrick's is the reason why I'm saying that. But as soon as I say that, I immediately regret it because it's kind of serious. I want to quickly address James Somerton because I think the day after I put out my video on his apology, he had a scheduled tweet with a suicide note in it that was like, if you see this tweet, I'm not alive anymore. And then I had a couple of absolutely brain-rotted individuals comment that I, I had blood on my hands like that i like for james summerton essentially by being like you shouldn't plagiarize stuff wait you had people telling you that i just blocked them on the channel immediately i was like yeah you're never allowed to speak again yeah <laughs> i was like yeah no, no i'm not even like oh like, uh, no you know obviously he's in I, a couple other people i know have put out statements as well like cavernacle said that he's not going to be talking about james summerton anymore and like that's totally valid but your video came out before that happened yeah before you knew about his mental state. So, like, how would you Mm -hmm. anticipate that? Yeah, and I'm not like Keffels, where I'm, like, dropping a monetized video on his, like, note. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, this was before that. I kept it up, and I kept it monetized because I said what I said, and and I meant it in regard to the structure of that video, and that has nothing to do with his mental health, and it's just something that is a bit... um, it was a bit jarring, and I wanted to address that I knew. The recent updates on Reddit, which I did put on my Twitter as well, excuse me, is that he's fine. Fine asterisk. No oubliex. You know what I mean? Fine with a with a note attached, you know? It's like he's alive to what we know. And like there was like a really blurry picture that like Nicholas Diorio tweeted. It was giving like when I see Sasquatch, you know what I mean? Like those types of pictures that was like allegedly James Somerton going into some sort of truck or something, which just like shows that he's alive, right? Or whatever. As far as I know, as of whatever, March 12th, more evidence suggests that he's fine than not. Next agenda, opening agenda thing before we get into like the actual topics. As far as topics today, we're going to do Finster. And, and parasocial stuff with kind of queer bidding and things like that. And then we're going to do book talk drama with Elle's going to explain that to me because I have no clue what's happening there. And then just a general kind of conclusion. So what we tend to do with these episodes, because I know a lot of people probably didn't see the old ones because I had like a thousand subs. It's usually like one of us hits one topic for a while and then another one of us hits the other topic for a while and then we bounce off like that. Our last, like, serious thing is uh, where the recent events with Ethan Klein have been of interest. I, last time I talked about Ethan Klein was because I was talking about Jacob Doolittle and I wasn't condemning Ethan Klein. So then people started to harass me. (laughs) Ah, Oh my God. Like, it was, anyway. So here's me condemning Ethan Klein like y'all wanted and I have done before. The comments on Palestine and on Aaron Bushnell were uh, absolutely disgusting and 
reprehensible. And my first reaction is that, um, don't say rest in power, that's, that's not for him. I see, the, le the leftist dialogue about this has been absolutely bananas. Um, my first reaction is this. It was absolutely insane how he, like, stood the whole time. That was crazy. I don't even know how that's humanly possible. Um, again, not to put this uncouth, but he's a champ at fucking burning love. I mean, that sounds bad, but he did it really good. Does that, that sound bad? We have to make levity of things. Does that sound bad that he was really good? I mean, but I mean that, not, I mean that as, a, as a compliment. Um, what the f*** are you guys angry about, you weirdos? I'm li what did they do? My God, stop. New wants conversation about this. That's the problem. Do you know what I mean? So extreme. It really pisses me off. Because I never said a damn bad thing about that guy. And that's why he says, when you need to explain your reason for calling me a racist, calling me genocidal, a Zionist, which, by the way, Zionist is just another slur for Jew, being a Jew. You know how many people now calling fucking every Jew a Zionist? It's like, okay, just call me a Jew and get it fucking over with. Call me the K-word, at least I'll know what you mean. It's just the truth. Not everybody, not all the time, but a lot of times, let's not fucking pretend that anti-Semitism isn't a fucking massive inferno of acceptable behavior right now on the left and the right. Nazis and leftists are dabbing the up saying Zionists, you know, and, you know, <clears throat> again, not to, I gotta, it's driving me insane. I gotta fucking talk about it. You know, I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like there's just not a tidal wave of anti-Semitism gobbling up the entire discourse. It's disgusting, man. And I'm, I'm doing, as, as an Israeli dual citizen, as someone who's deeply invested in the state of Israel, who's probably more sympathetic to the Israeli perspective than most people would be. I've tried so hard to pull myself to some kind of central ground where we can have a real conversation about this stuff. I, I'm pulled myself all the way to, you know, outright saying that it's apartheid, that it's genocide, that the Israeli government is, is committing. And so, but you still want to call me a racist and a genocide and a Zionist. Why would you call me a Zionist if it wasn't just, oh, you're a Jew? When I have said all the things that you want to hear from me, I want to meet you right in the mail and you still spit in my face. So give me a break. Who's the problem? Scumbag. Scumbag. I had a membership yeah. to the H3 podcast channel for a really long time because I joined when the BBTV stuff was happening because he was talking about it in the members live streams. and I wanted to see them. I showed I showed my boyfriend this too. It wouldn't let me leave. Like it just wasn't working. No matter, like I would click like a thousand times, it wouldn't work. And then I, but when that happened, I like made a conceited because it's auto build on my credit cards and it's only five dollars, so I wouldn't notice, right? For months and months at a time. And then once in a while, I'd be like, oh, I could say something in the chat, whatever. Then I would forget again to cancel it. So it was just one of those things, like when you leave a subscription open for like way too long, you like do not remember. Uh, cause I also didn't usually watch the podcast on my computer. I did, would play it off like my TV or something while I was doing stuff. I don't know why I have to explain that. I don't know. It's because like, I don't want people I to think that I was like hyper invested in them. Cause I kind of was always had like a pretty, at least like interpersonally, like a distance, you know, I watched it because it was like a drama variety show that could tell me what's going on without me having to look for everything by myself because they have nine employees and I have none. Why well, you kind of, but as a joke, but like, I don't have like actual employees. So yeah, this is like a pro Palestine channel. This is a pro Palestine podcast. We love an alliteration also. Uh, like we were just talking like in real life about it and sending each other stuff and just being like, well, how can you be so purposefully obtuse about things? I don't know. It was very jarring. So that's kind of my opinions. It was like, I was like, whoa. So I canceled the, I, I like, cause I was like, I had an email written for like YouTube support of like, of like, get me out of here, you know? I've tried to cancel it like four or five other times. It doesn't work. Get me out. And then um, it worked on my phone. If anybody, phone? yes, which is weird because you can't join on your phone. So I thought you couldn't cancel on your phone either. So oh. if you find you have a YouTube membership that you're trying to get rid of, pro tip now, I guess, from experience, and it doesn't work on your computer to get out of, it works on your phone. You can leave from your phone. You can't join from your phone. And I also unsubscribe, whatever, fully disengaged have not seen a single episode even though i was very interested in what bevo had to say but i'll watch the tiny meat gang one instead i actually didn't know ethan had been posting because i don't think i'm getting notifications but i did notice that hassan interviewed sam cedar who um is an anti-zionist uh, he's jewish and an anti-zionist 
And I was listening to like, you know, just it's frustrating to hear Ethan's opinions on the Aaron Bushnell thing because, you know, I feel like Sam uh, really like drove home a lot of like crucial points about it. And it's a good interview. People should watch it. I think it's one thing to not get it. Okay. Yeah. Like, I, it's one thing to not yeah. get it, but to it, then you know? yell at people in your chat and call them idiots and tell and say that they're no. pro. I can't see that beyond being, and, and I hate when people say like, you're being purposefully obtuse or you're being like antagonistic on purpose, or you're being contrarian on purpose to me. Cause it's, it's never true. I've never purposefully, I'm not a potster online. Uh, for people who know me in real life, like I just, I'm not actually that em uh, emotionally invested in the internet because I didn't have it growing up. So formatively, it just doesn't click to me in the same way as it does for a lot of people. Like for me, it's like, I get very little, like I'm a, I'm a huge extrovert, but if I'm at home and I'm talking to people on the internet, that doesn't do it for me. Like, it's not the same. I, I have no, I genuinely do not feel the same way. I could talk to Elle on like FaceTime. That's good. Like to me, that's like, that functions the same way, but like interactions on Twitter, interactions through my comments, interactions like that for me doesn't do too, too much. I love the comments and everything, but I'm saying in the sense of like my emotional investment, right? So to have somebody, and then the thing is too, right? Like when the crew pushes back or whatever, it's a ton of like, oh, but blah, 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 but blah, 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 like all of these, all of these things. And it's, it's clearly, and um, Paige Christie made a really good video. Paige and I like know each other through the internet or whatever. Like we talk and stuff but we talk in in the way that like xylee and i talk kind of thing too where it's like we understand that we foundationally disagree on a lot of stuff i'm way more left-leaning than xylee for sure and Paige as well i think but it's because yeah. Paige is, is british though so it's harder for me to get it because i'm like who are you talking about <laughs> like who is that so i would usually kind of steer clear of her ethan klein videos because she was part of the commentary community with like nick and turkey tom and tipster and all that stuff who would just kind of fuel things for no reason and would be a little bit overly i i made a joke in a really old video that like the bingo card the free square is six videos about how much they hate ethan klein like that <laughs> and um i just found that to be good. yeah but then i watched her recent one and it was like <laughs> Pretty clickbaity mm -hmm. thumbnail. Like it was like kind of clickbaiting the Kaysler. That's and I was like, background knows how to make a thumbnail. And I was like, um, I, because I thought that I didn't even know that it happened. So that's why I was like, girl, why are you clickbaiting the word? But then it's because in, I think the member stream, he, he compared being called a Zionist to being called the K word. I was like, oh, <laughs> whoa, whoa. He did what? <laughs> yeah. It was either in the member stream or it was in the, um, uh, the after dark episode or something, but he there was like a line of comparison there. So yeah, like in when this comes out, the link with the video will be in the description. I'll send it to you after if you want to listen to it, mm -hmm. like on the way to work or something like that or whatever. It's like I was like, girl, holy smokes! Because like I said, like some of I was very neutral. I was like very conflict neutral on on uh, Ethan for a long time because it's like I I like to try to give those people as much room to grow as possible because I know the the span of their effect on people. You know? I feel like the what I agr I agree to some extent cuz my I was introduced to Ethan back in like 2018 my ex at the time who ended up being a really, sh uh, like, bad dude, just in general. Um, he introduced me to their channel, and, like, I remember it was, like, right before or after they posted their episode with Jordan Peterson, and I was just like, nah, dude, like, this guy's a pseudoscience, like, it. this guy's all pseudoscience, like, you know, I was in university at the time, so I knew that. I even had professors cracking jokes about how Jordan Peterson is actually quite, like, um... Like, he doesn't have a lot of academic distinction or, like, accolades. No, for He's, reference, he, too, L went... Yeah, L went to university in Toronto. He taught at University of oh, Toronto. Yeah. And then L went to the... Um, there's two other universities. There's York at TMU, formerly known as Ryerson University. And mm -hmm. um, so she didn't go to U of T. She went to one of the other ones. And uh, everybody knew. And I went to U Waterloo, and they knew. Mm -hmm. Like, Jordan Peterson was a 
was a topic of of discussion to a certain degree and Ooh. and for those of you who don't know university of waterloo is one of the like most conservative like mainstream universities in canada and there was a class called gender studies gen- um philosophy of gender studies which i have taken like a crazy like manosphere guy went and stabbed like five people yeah. Year, and it was like the year after I graduated. Like it was like the next semester after I finished. The first time that class had been taught in person since before the pandemic, I took it online. I was like, that could have been me. Like that's what like what I'm saying is, is that if at conservative university, people were like, you know, professors were like Jordan Peterson in the academic space is a nothing burger. It was interesting um, mm-hmm. to hear your perspective on it as For well. Sure. No, totally. And that was the thing. So I kind of like, wrote off Ethan for a bit. And then I noticed him kind of t- start to turn around when he hired Dan. Yeah. And based like, Dan, yeah. Dan who pushes back all the time. Like Dan, all Dan who like saved the legacy of leftovers. Let's be real, but continue. No, seriously. And then, um, yeah. So like, I didn't, I was like, a, I didn't really watch them at all. I knew about them because sometimes they would do again, drama reporting on niche drama. Right. And then they, you know, started doing like drama again and reporting. So like I would tune in a little bit here and there, but um, yeah, normally I like to give people space to grow, but with how Ethan has been treating Frogan on Twitter and like, I, I enjoy Frogan. I, I don't agree with all of her takes all the time. Um, but like the way that he's directed harassment at her, like the, honestly, I'd go as far to say anti-Arab sentiments, mm-hmm. you know, towards her is really repulsive, especially considering, like, Ethan is aware of her dynamic with Hassan. It seems almost antagonistic and, at this point. And also two Arab employees, who, that which too. one of them is the son of a mm. very large pro-Arab organization, right? Like, we were talking yeah. about this. It was, like, it's the equivalent, I'll, I can't remember, I can never remember what it's called, but H- AB's dad is, like, head of, like, the, there's, there's, like, the NAACP or whatever for black people. It's, like, that version but for Arabs, and I can't remember what it's called because I, I should have checked before. I forgot to put it in the doc, but anyway. Mm. Yeah, and then there's a lot of comments too about like leveraging platforms and things like that. I don't think it's necessarily that simple because I've, I've talked about this before too when people said like do a, a rhetoric of Ethan Klein. I said I can't because he's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I've like actually, I've said that in multiple streams. Like I could be clipped for that like more than once. Is me well, just Ethan being like, there's nothing. No, but there's, yeah, there's no... Uh, consistency or cohesion when i do rhetoric videos is it's i'm coming for you because you're doing this on purpose right like i'm coming for you to go through things that you've been doing to somebody so else keep, yeah you know so like let's see like britney yeah. dawn right where it was like a full revamp of the personality a shift in the content uh because of this audience that you can reach in that way or if we're talking about mama max it was like you are man- trying to manipulate larger content creators to validate this internal feeling, masking it as a better cost, like things like that, right? But Ethan, mm-hmm. it's like, okay, so I got to go through this one uh, emotional uh, rant, and then I got to go through this other emotional rant, and then I've got to go through uh, the 30th Keemstar video, then I got to go through, it's like, okay, uh, or or the, uh, oh, another Ryan Kavanaugh thing. It's like, it's not, same thing with Ryan so- Kavanaugh almost had me unsubscribing too. The oh, you Ryan didn't like Kavanaugh- that? This is so drawn out. Who even is this man? But I also understand, like, you know, I think it was something to, like it's obviously court related. Like Ethan and Ryan are going to court, so it is like serious. But simultaneously, it's like it's just like video after video after video, dude. Like it was just so much of the content for a while. That yeah. is that is our comments on on that because like again, I'm trying not to get, I'm trying not to have pictures taken to the front of my apartment. So. Uh, <laughs> funny thing before we move into the topics last thing we were talking about paradise lost the other day and <laughs> you already know where I'm going. and l and i were arguing not arguing at all but like so i was telling l that that i didn't i don't really know a lot about the bible because my parents were like anti-theists like they were they did it they were directly like anti religion because of a lot of trauma due to like the French Catholic Church in, in Quebec and things like that. Right. So they were like, you know, my my brother came home from school like crying one time because a girl said that he was going to hell because he didn't go to church. And my dad said, What's your problem? Hell's not real. Like he just like dropped that. Like he was like nine. I was like seven. <laughs> it's like, oh well, what's your problem? Then it's not real. Like 
So that's like the household that I grew up in, right? And we only had a love Bible. And <laughs> <laughs> and like, so like my French reading level, I would say is like eighth grade, like now, like eighth grade novel, I guess, area set like, like either like very late elementary to middle school level. It's not great because I don't read in French regularly. Like it's just not something that I do that often. And reading in French is really difficult for those of you who don't know the language that well. They have a verb tense called passé simple that you that is used for writing passive narratives, but you never use it in speech or you never see it in like in like articles in like media. So like even they know it's too hard. And a lot of books are written in passé simple, and I think La Bible is written in passé simple. So anyway, I would try to look at it just to kind of see what the what the fuss is about. <laughs> And then, and then I was like, this doesn't make any, I can't, I don't understand this at all, right? Because the Bible is a complex read for native speakers of whatever language it is, yeah. right? So I'm looking at it, and I'm like, this isn't helping me. Like, okay, a Genesis, uh, sure, like, I don't know what that is. Like, so I was telling Elle that I did on a midterm, I said Paradise Lost was in the Bible. And then, <laughs> and then my professor was like, are you stupid? Or is it like, are you really that like on a way? And I was like, I don't know. I was also kind of stressed. Like, and you never said it wasn't. And it was a story about people in the Bible. So I just kind of like tried to put two and two together. I don't know. But I was saying to Elle that Eden, in ev even in Paradise Lost, was like, an evil woman who doomed society. L was like, Mika, she's a rhetorician. Like, she's a queen, which, like, sure. But then I said, so was Skylar White, and they still hated her ass. I'm just saying, for any or for any uh, Christians out there, the fact that I didn't get lit on fire by a lightning bolt because I said Skylar White and Eden are the same. For those of you who don't know, I'm talking about, like, the wife of Walter White in Breaking Bad. That's who Skylar is. I just thought that was so funny. And I was like, I need to recount that because that was like one of my worst or best moments ever, depending on how you want to swing it. <laughs> it did. I had cracked up about that one, too. And I thought about that. And I was like, I mean, yeah, you know, obviously, I don't think Paradise Lost is like in a, like the up, like top tier literature. Like I wouldn't put that in like my but it's it's very in influential on like 16th century literature. Like it, it was a very influential piece. Like, um the devil was never depicted as a snake in any previous biblical texts until that piece came out. And then the revisions of the Bible. And like, then they Kim Kardashian's like, <laughs> and then Kim <laughs> Kardashian's Taylor Swift beef a la Paradise Lost. Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> so no, for all for those of you who just heard the audio cut, uh, Al said the word that got us demonetized last time. So let's remember <laughs> no, it's okay, girl. It'll be funny. I just, it's, uh, oh my God, that would be so sad. I was like, oh my God, it was literally because the C word just instantly gets you nuked, despite the fact that I use that as like a verb, an adjective, a noun, uh, like in my regular, a verb probably. Well, yeah, to serve the said word. So yeah, it's, it's everything in my, in my vernacular, but I can't use it. So segue. So. I'm going to teach us about Finster today for some reason. So what we're going to do is I'm going to show you what I'm talking about. Finster, for those of you who do not know, is a Twitch streamer. Bo this is according to my boyfriend knows all the lore for some reason, which maybe I should be <laughs> checking why that is. But it, it is it is what it is. So this is Finster. Okay, so what ha according to my boyfriend, a couple of other people who like knew the Finster lore is Finster is a Twitch streamer who that's what he looked like before. The pronouns say he slash she, so we're using both. And so I like to mix it up, you know. I don't know if that's copyright, <laughs> so we're going to I don't know if that's copyright, so we're going to ignore that. So Finster, what it was, was Finster said that they dress like a girl if they reached a certain amount of donos in a month. But Finster was meeting that every single month. 
So as every month went on, he made a point to like up the ante a little bit, you know, lash extensions, nails, like the full outfits, like. Um, I think he, I think, he, I think he had like a corset kind of moment to like, kind of like, you know, make the physique more, you know, shave her legs too and everything. Like it, it, it kind of upped every, you know, like I was telling my boyfriend, I was like, girl, I'm going to, I'm about to be a left for Finster because Finster does way more upkeep than me. Like I don't do lashes. I don't do nails. I think Finster's legs look so smooth. Like I think she's rocking like laser hair removal. Like I'm genuinely convinced that she's done laser. Like I like... And and I'm like, man, I wish I had like Finster upkeep money anyway. And then obviously like the hair growth and everything. Right. So but then mm. people were like, you're leaning into this way too much. Like you are really, 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 really leaning into this one. And it's because like she looks like like this. She's she's also, yeah, doing only fans probably. Horny posting. We live. Like, this is a very, like... This isn't androgynous by any means, you know? So then people were kind of like, well, you're ma- you're almost, like, masquerading as a trans woman was kind of, like, the, the pushback, you know? You keep insisting that you're a guy. You keep insisting that it's just a bit. But it's been, like, two years. And, like, even you've, you've gone to these lengths... I think those are microbladed brows too. That looks like there's like a tint and everything. And people were like, okay, well, like you're masquerading as a trans woman. If if that's how what you're saying it is, you know? He was like, No, I'm just, you know, I I've gotten used to it. I kind of like it, but I'm I'm a dude, you know? And everyone was like, Well, you're gonna start like HRT like in six months. Like people were doing like uh if you do donos oh, like over a certain called, amount, they're calling it will- an egg. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The egg. egg. Yeah. Yeah. And like, Mm -hmm. there's the turn. There's like, if you pay a certain amount to a lot of streamers, Pyrocynical is really famous for doing this. The TTS, the text to speech donos. Pyrocynical will get ones where it's like someone's like in do like inflation jokes or something. (laughs) People with TTS Finster being like, oh, can you like? Like, I saw one on TikTok, and I don't know if I saved it. Oh, I should have saved it. I'll see if I can find it again. I'll do, I'll go back to my watch history later, but it was like confirmed that you're not going to do HRT in a few months. Like you're not gonna like confirm that you're not on HRT. So in six months, I have this clip, and then Finster's like, "Yeah, no, I'm not doing it." And then I think that's how my dad talks about me. Can you please confidently tell us that you will never start HRT? Uh, I just need a quick clip that I can reference in about half a year. (laughs) No, I'm never gonna take HRT. Recently, for the last six months or so, I started HRT. Whatever, on March 1st, the coming out video happens where Fitzer just says, like, that um, they're gender fluid, so he, she, they, I think it's they too, but maybe I'm being silly. Hold on. Let me, I know it's doing a bit of weird stuff here. Um, So it just says he slash she, so I guess, but I don't know. But gender fluid, anyway, I'm confused. Regardless, he's like, yeah, yeah, I'm never doing it, da, 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 da. And then this video comes out and it's serious because the other thing is Finster has kind of clickbaited this more than once. Mm. So people were like, clickbaiting it. Yeah. You know, you're not serious. But then people saw like the little twinkly lights that are very specific colors. And Mm -hmm. and then so I wasn't going to watch it. And then people were like, no, this is real. Like, this is fully real this time. So this was the video saying that she's on HRT, but that like. She's kind of gender fluid. She's just more physically comfortable presenting, I guess, more femme or whatever. Her relationship with gender is quite complex and Ooh. nuanced. And this is Can't Twitter. <laughs> this is Twitter we're looking at. Yeah. So clearly nobody gets it. <laughs> like clearly we're gonna have a problem. The oh, wow, I'm so surprised. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So you might have noticed for the last six Can months you hear or so, this? when someone asks on stream yes. or on Twitter or Reddit or something, he's been on HRT. I uh, I just avoid the question. I avoid the question entirely and make a little joke, and that's solely because recently I started HRT. Confetti. 
<laughs> it took a while to feel comfortable to make this video. Even now, I am very scared. <laughs> I don't know why, but I want so badly to be able to talk about stuff that I've been doing, and it's really hard to if no one knows. I want to talk about my life openly and all the amazing things that have happened. So it's kind of nervous excitement, I guess. I spent so many months scared and stressed out about trying to pick a label. I'm still not done yet. I still haven't figured absolutely everything out, but I'm feeling comfortable enough to talk about it now. So wait, wait, so does this mean you're a woman now? We'll get to that in a minute. We gotta do the serious bit first. Why? <laughs> okay, well, honestly, this might like be a little bit it's controversial. Fun. I cross-dressed on Twitch for years. <laughs> After doing it for it's a meme, I wanted to editing. explore my gender a bit more. People have been making egg jokes or saying I'm on HRT for years. And kind of because of that, a lot of the trans community started popping into streams or like seeing my videos or interacting with me. And that had never happened to me before. And I learned a lot. And um, some of it seemed a little bit too interesting. <laughs> it felt a bit like I uncovered a part of myself that I'd be purposefully just shutting down for as long as I can remember and never questioned why. I have this notes page on my phone from over a year ago now with a handwritten note of like pros and cons list of taking HRT. And when I went to go Boobies, fill Boobies, two list, question marks. There wasn't much I could come up with, so I started. Oh, also, I know it's stupid, but I wanted to say it. I did factor in the whole, like, I wonder if doing streaming and the money that's kind of attached to it is the reason I wanted to do this. Like, is it warping my brain? I did think about that. I've streamed for years and it's been my entire life and I've made a lot of money off it. And I wonder if that's what's affecting me and making me want to do this. And it's not. This isn't I can exactly tell by something that I just decided. You're a girl, girl <laughs> kind of thing. And then did. <laughs> That's a joke, yeah. by the way, obviously. But I'm like, that's not a that's not a straight guy couch, is all I'm saying. No. That mustard yellow couch. But um, yeah, so that's kind of the Finster stuff too, like on a surface level, right? And yeah, so but a lot of people, right, were throwing around like queer baiting, queer baiting, queer baiting. They did it, they did that to Billie Eilish too for yeah. years, right? And being all mad about it. And they it's also like, did it to Becky Alberti, the author of Love, Simon, who yes. they were like, this white woman fetishizes queer men and, yep. you know, we need to get her out of our community. Meanwhile, the whole time she's bisexual and like is navigating how to A, come to terms with that, but also come to terms with that publicly because I'm young enough to remember because I'm an older Gen Z, just how like much of a big deal it was to have YA books with queer leads like yeah. even at the library they would always circulate a little less than like you know the typical like cis hat relationships right so yeah like they did it to Becky Al Albert Albertari Al Albertali Albertali I think it is yeah they did it to her too the author of Love Simon people weaponize it like their nosiness what? about it because like I've gotten like people being annoyed where it's like, oh, are you like queer baiting? Like you, you know, um, or like I, so I talked about, let's say I have a, I, one of my most popular videos is a video on lesbian TikTok, right? <laughs> and, so, and it's called like, what's going on on hashtag lesbian TikTok? Because there was a lot of like allegations. That was when Sedona was like wilding out and all that kind of stuff, right? And then a bunch of people got mad at me because I was I was a straight woman talking about lesbians. And I was like, okay, bay at down there, Moodsy. It's first off, I can observe allegations and people were calling it on TikTok. This is what's happening on lesbian TikTok. Like that was how it was being referred to in the circles that it existed in. So I was respecting the references to what it actually was. That's like saying we could report on James Charles's allegations if we're not gay men. Yeah, and it's also like you know? I always I've, I've said this since the dawn of time, and as in like since yeah. I was like in elementary school, I think, like grade six or something, being like I feel like the thing is is like I lean way more like ace, like I'm far on that like you know. So I always say it's like I'd probably be into girls. I'm just never really into anyone, so I don't really know. And I've said that for years and years and years where it's like, if it happens, it happens. And I wouldn't be that surprised is, is sort of my, but then I didn't want to do like unlabeled or any of that shit because like the Harry style stands, like just destroyed that one for us. Uh, <laughs> the Harry yeah. style stands nuked that one. <laughs> like, so it became like this like complex topic that I just wasn't really, I never really wanted to 
to address or get into because it's it's just I never I don't care. I that's why like I felt like I related to Finster a lot because like Finster said like I just don't care. Like I just it's not even that like I feel like I align with certain people or that I need community. I genuinely just don't care. And that's where I was at too. Where it's like it's like I'm not looking for like pansexual community, bisexual community, straight community, ace community. I I genuinely don't care. I'm just like whatever happens happens and it happens and I'll mention it if it happens. You know what I mean? Like that's it. And the fact that like there seems to be no option for like not apathy but like neutrality around it, especially like I said, if you're clo- um, Fitzgerald's ace too, I think I think Fitzgerald's actually because I remember there was like <laughs> I remember seeing a clip and I think she said like probably has autism, ace and kind of trans like triple homicide or something. He says a joke or whatever, and it was uh- like. And it was like, you know, I was like, yeah, I I resonate with that sentiment of like, it doesn't really matter to some yeah. people, but it's because it's some people's lives so much that mm-hmm. they perpetuate that onto other people. And, but I've never really, denied the privilege. So much media yeah. And I've never denied the privilege of, of a straight relationship, you know, no. like it's, but I've also, but like, I also have never like felt super in tune with that because a lot of people say like, if you straight people never think about it, you know? Yeah. They, they don't. And, like I think about it all the time, like the concept and like how it would work and unpacking it and what, you know, what um, aspects of society have influenced me and which ones have not and how it would, you know what I mean? That kind of stuff. So it's like, exactly. clearly there's clearly there's some fruit in the basket. If that's why I have to think about it that hard. But at the same time, it's like, who cares? <laughs> like, mm. so. I think, too, like, when we talk about parasociality, a lot of this is feeling like, a lot of this is audience feeling like creators owe them. Yeah. You know, it's like, yes. you owe me this. You owe me this. Like, because ContraPoints and Philosophy Tube experience similar things. And I'm curious, I, I imagine, you know, because um, Finster was actually featured in a, uh, philosophy tube video i believe regarding transness i can't remember the exact video but um i wouldn't be surprised if like abby was like you know supportive of finster behind the scenes because you know having experienced that herself she specifically after because contra transitioned publicly and people were very not kind to her she went like non-binary to trans woman abigail thorn of philosophy tube transitioned secretly behind the scenes and then used philosophy tube scripts and costuming to um you know transition seem like it out of the public yeah. eye while still doing her job right yeah so it's just so it, and that's the thing it's it's it really illustrates the the cruelty but also like the entitlement that fans can have over you know, idols, right? It's it's really damaging to not only... Because imagine being that invested. Like, you know, I understand, Um, you know, maybe if, like, Finster had been a cis het man all along and was doing this for views and money. Because, like, you know, I, I'm sure there might be people doing that. But I just but, feel like it's know, so obvious. Like, you're not yeah. committing to the bit that much. Like, nobody's... Yeah. Co- like nobody's committing to the bit like that where it's like, yeah. you know, horny posting girl pictures for funsies. Like, it's just not exactly. the same. I feel like it's not. And like, you know, it kind of, it, it's kind of like we've gone horseshoe theory with like gender sometimes because, you know, we went from like the binary to like, we need to abolish gender to like, okay, when you dress up like a woman, you're immediately a woman. And it's like, you're not really giving people the time to like explore fluidity. And that's kind of the whole point with abolishing the gender binary is allowing people to dress how they want. And like, again, like not assuming that just because someone is dressed a certain way that that's their gender. Like how many times do tomboys get confused as lesbians? Right. Or like that used to be like an old, like, stereotype for like people who dress more masculine is that oh you're lesbian and it's like well that's not necessarily true yeah 
It's like, you know, because so much of because I'm scrolling through Finster's social media and I didn't realize it was this racy. But like there are a lot of (laughs) because there's a lot of horny posting on there, like a lot of like, you know, very um, I don't want to say explicit because it sounds boomerish because like there's clothes and stuff. But very um, racy, racy, racy. Yeah. Yeah. Very like racy photos, but always femme presenting. Right. Like it's there's a clear like, you know, and same thing as like duality of man is a picture of like when presenting as a man versus presenting as a as a femme or with something along that line. Right. And it's just like a lot of. Like there's a lot of like clear love for the female form kind of thing or something like that. You know, a lot of love for like the femme aesthetic and how it yeah. makes it makes her feel and whatever. And like that's not because like let's say for example, like you can make a similar accusation about Steven Crowder. <laughs> right? <laughs> like why are you always cross dressing? Oh, because you know? Steven's dressed up as a woman? <laughs> yes. And like a suspicious amount of bits, you know what I mean? But like Yeah. Steven Crowder in his free time is presenting as like the macho man type, you know? I'm just imagining Steven Crowder as a woman and I feel like he would look like the stepsister from Shrek, like Doris. I think he'd look like the mean teacher from Matilda. Oh, like Agatha Trunchbull? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Miss Trunchbull or whatever. Like that's what Steven Crowder would look like as as a lady. But yeah, from there... It expands to, like, the concept of, like, queer baiting in regular discourse, right? And how it's kind of become the new form of, like, forced outing, you know? Yeah. As opposed to, like... It's socially acceptable because people are leveraging it as, like, no, 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 I'm more moral because what you're doing is actually offensive to these communities. And, you know, I think that there is... You know, because the queer community has been historically persecuted, there is merit in questioning, you know, the authenticity people who may not have exactly and people who may not have good intentions. Simultaneously, you know, we can't let that hostility overwhelm our curiosity, you know? And I think too, like, cause it it just feels like it's like the same mm. ideology in a different form. Where before it was like, I need to know if you're homosexual because you're a deviant versus now it's like, I need to know what you're doing so I can know like where you side in certain spaces and discourse. Like, are you just an ally or you, can I relate to you more? And again, and then that circles back into like what they feel like they owe you, you owe them as someone who creates content, right? Yeah. And the harm that that can really put on to someone like i said for me like i'm not harmed okay like i i'm mildly annoyed at best once in a while you know what i mean like and a lot of it too could be my own repression because of where i grew up and all that kind of stuff mind you if i like went home and i'm like yo i'm big gay my parents would be like love that for you like they don't like it's trust me they're fine with it if i was or wasn't you know there was a lot of speculation that my brother was gay for a really long time. Uh, weirdly enough, like in the small town we lived in, and then my parents were like, they were like, if you are or aren't, we don't care. Just like, you know, if you are, let us know eventually in case someone tries to like harm you because of the place like we grew up in, like a rural Quebec English area, very highly hostile, very religious and highly hostile towards um people who are uh, of different uh, sexualities. I remember in the 11th grade, we had a PSA project and I did mine on sexualities, which was like very based at the time. It was also 2017. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it was like extra hostile, right? At the time. And I remember one of my students, one of my students, teacher talk. Oh my God. Good Lord. They were with my classmate. Hello. <laughs> But um, uh, one, one of, of my, my yeah, one of my classmates came, essentially came out in my PSA, kind of confirmed that he was bisexual. And then this guy called him the F slur in the hallway after that in the same like hour. 
when my whole video was like, just be normal about it. Hello. Like that was kind of what my yeah. thesis was. So he had paid shit. Yeah. And then he just like called him a slur in the same day. <laughs> I'm yeah. just like, okay. Hmm. <laughs> you know, almost like typical middle school boy behavior. I actually think the person that I'm talking about is trans now. I actually think at least I think they're non-binary. I I should have remembered that. But I before people before people come for me, I only have one friend from high school left. I have and I've and when I've not spoken to a single other one in five years or or more. Oh, sorry. So high school, middle school. Yeah. So I but, right. but what I'm but what I'm saying yeah. is like I the only reason I kind of know that is because I think someone told me. So I don't even know if it's real if it's true or not. If I'm gonna I'm gonna we're gonna go back we're gonna go to to, to they them pronouns because I actually think that's what they use. I just didn't remember that till just now. Anyway, because I haven't seen them since high school. So the point is this person was queer presumably now with with added context that i just remembered had a complex relationship with gender right and these these like hyper misogynistic racist losers would sniff that out like the dog at the airport you know like the drug dog at the at the airport like and i remember so i actually have, i guess i technically have two friends from high school because my i'm friends with my ex-boyfriend for some reason now and he was telling, and he's still friends with a lot of them. And he was telling me about like, one of them got married recently and they had like a bachelor party. Okay. And he was like, oh, they were trying to like get this guy to like flash them. Like, it's like, we wanted this guy to pull his dick out for some reason. Like, and I'm like, well, first off, that's sexual coercion, point one. Point two, yeah. aren't all y'all like homophobes? Like I was like, why is it that the most homophobic people are low-key weird? Because Steven Crowder did that in the workplace and there was a whole thing about that, right? I'm like, yeah. what is it about homophobes and two shots of and, and two shots of um Salsa Silver that hit that makes them like think that like this guy's gonna pull his fuck out? Like it's like, Did you read that study <laughs> that came out that said that the most red states with the most harsh like trans anti-trans laws are the ones that have the highest like trans searches on on like porn you know, and stuff porn yeah. yeah no like i said it's yeah. like it's like and he's telling me that and i'm like these are the most homophobic people i know like this mm. is like you know oh my god and i'm i'm waiting now that i'm even breathing this i'm waiting for like the dm on about me like you're the worst person ever anyway i'll just you know I'll be like, pull up, girl, I dare you. Like, at this point, it's like, pull up, I dare you. I got a five iron in my closet. You've been going to the gym. Well, yeah, because one of them, the last time they talked to me, they threatened me. So, like, that was the last conversation we had. So, I'm like, you know, come through, girl. I got a five iron in my closet in Minecraft. You know, like, at this point, I'm like, I'm like, I've been, this is, genuinely, this is why... If you ever know, because you followed me on Instagram for, for years, right? That's why on Instagram, I never talk about my videos. Like on Twitter, right? I'll be like, what do you want to see? Like, what are we doing? Da, 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 da. Like, I'm very like in with the, but on Instagram, I very rarely. It's like, if I have a video with somebody else, I'll put it on Instagram. If I, if I hit like a subscriber milestone, I'll put it on Instagram. But I'm very like touch and go with that because. Yeah. People from my high school, when I started making videos, I was doing get ready with me videos where I would just talk about stories about like my life or whatever, because I've lived a, an absolutely bananas life. If uh, like a lot of crazy stuff absolutely. has happened. You got introduced, yo, your life is crazy because you got introduced to One Direction via Ed Broadbent. Yeah. Like, why did you feel like that? <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Ed Broadbent was the leader of the New Democratic Party in Canada. So the leader of a, of a major political party, like one of the big, th there's, there's like the big three, there's the NDP, the conservatives and the liberal party. Liberals and conservatives are, are the ones that have been in power historically, but NDP has, has, is either has come very close or has been the party responsible for what's called a minority government, which means if one party does not have 50% or more of the votes, which means then that multiple parties can come together to vote for things. Our system is way more, um, <laughs> democratic than the american one where it's like there's way more say from different entities and then there's a whole party called the Bloc Québécois, which we could get into that at a different day but uh because <laughs> i i explained to americans where i'm like imagine if texas was french but they also had their own political party like 
or like California had their own political party because actually by I think California is the most populated state and then it's New York. It would be mm-hmm. like the second most populated state if they had their own political party. And it's a really hard thing to explain. You or it's do almost, a video on that. It's almost like if there was a party for the Hispanics in California, you know, because it's like the French people in Quebec. Right. And it's like the because like they have a huge Mexican population because California was Mexico. Right. So it's that, like this is the block doesn't even win in a lot of their, you know, um, writings because they have like there's still a ton of Anglophones. Yeah. in Like, yeah. Well, it's also because the blocks like the block, no pun intended, is made to block things realistically. Yeah. Like every time. And I've explained this to like on to people. I explain to people from Ontario all the time. Ev- almost every minority government is respond is because of the block. Quebec what people would vote for the block. Anyway. No, it's true. Anyway, Ed Broadbent led one of, and he was the guy who made the NDP one of the big three. Prior to that, mm-hmm. it was like it didn't exist. So he's like a really famous. Well, I don't know about that. Tommy Douglas, like he's the one yeah, who founded. The he party. founded it, but Ed Broadbent's the yeah. one who popularized it. And then Jack Layton yeah. is the modern movement, right? There's the three big NDP yeah. leaders. He's one of the three of them. Well, and and the reason why I, I'm saying this too is because they gave him the type of funeral that they give to the prime ministers that die. Like the, the, mm-hmm. the ones that are like the big, they're in like the, the pr- parliament property and you can come in and visit. And it's like a whole thing. Right. Yeah. It's so like if Mitt Romney died, like he wasn't president, but he was like pretty close to being president. Yeah. And they, and, but they also yeah. like, they, the Jack Layton had a, a, the similar funeral was the, yeah. so really, really, really beloved leaders will get those funerals too, but it's usually prime ministers only. So like, Let's say like Stephen Harper passes away, he would get that funeral. But like mm-hmm. um, Tom Mulcair will not, who was another no. NDP leader, but nobody cared about him. You know, it's kind of like anyway. So he passed away very recently, and I was talk and I was really ups- I was upset about it because he was my childhood best friend's granddad, and would take me around. I went to Cirque du Soleil with him. I've been to his cottage a bunch of times. Um, he gave me books, like my first political books, which I'm not really into, are Ed Broadbent's books because his granddaughter wasn't into that stuff and neither was his grandson. So like he kind of saw in me like somebody that he could share those things with. And uh, what was funny is, is that he would go to, to England all the time because his he liked to vacation there. And then it was like 2010 and he came back with like a bit of, of like One Direction merchandise or something. It was like it was like right when the album was coming out. He had the CD and he had like a poster or something. And he was like, oh, my dear granddaughter, um, who doesn't share the same last name. So I'm not even going to drop the first name because it's like completely just leave her out of it kind of thing. Um, oh, my dear granddaughter, there's this new band that's really popular in, in the UK called that that was on the X Factor called One Direction. And with like bringer stuff. And that was how I found out who One Direction was, which I think is so funny where it's like she had all this exclusive. I remember I got to listen to Take Me Home Yearbook Edition before it came out in North America because Ed Broadbent brought back the CD. Like, uh, <laughs> and I know that guy. she's like just gotten rid of that stuff. Like, I know she doesn't, she didn't care about it. And I'm like, I would kill for like the 20, the December 2012 yearbook edition cd of one direction that was in the actual book like i'm so sad (laughs) if i think about it for too long but i think uh, i actually have that copy somewhere so i think my grandma got it for me it was either take me home or midnight memories in the book i think i have it somewhere the to my recollection the uk version is now called the ultimate edition on spotify so it was like a little bit different there was like one extra song or something they would do that kind of thing uh, pretty often but with that weird loop around conversation now you oh, must yeah. teach me Can about I... books so now i need to learn about books as if i don't have this paper above my head about books but these are <laughs> teenager books and tiktok so that'll be fun basically i wanted to talk about this because i feel like not enough people talked about this drama when it happened and i actually was unfortunate enough to be on Twitter while this like dumpster fire was happening. And I remember how much it reminded me of creep show art. And that's why I've been wanting to talk to you about this for uh, like, I guess it's been a couple of weeks now, right? 
Yeah. It's, well, it's been a couple weeks since this happened, but yeah, like it just reminded me so much of creep show art. So basically there's this author and they do go, they are non-binary. They use she, they, their name is Kate Corain. That's our first major player here. Also, before I get into this, I just want to preface that, yeah, I did kind of watch this un like unfold online, but I also did watch with Cindy, um, her entire video on this. So if you want, like, we can link that in the, in the doobly do. I want to say like freaking a vlog brother. Cause I'm cringe. The description. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, also if you want to screen share any of the video, let me know. Cause I'll turn, I have it open on my other tab here. Yeah, do you want to screen share the, just the thumbnail of Cindy's video? Like, I don't know if you want to like go into like watching the whole thing. It is like 15 minutes long. But um, Cindy and like most of the information and the timeline here I'm getting from her channel. So definitely go watch her video if you want more context on this situation. There's also another um, like Cindy is a uh, like a critic, like a book critic um, and a YouTuber. Uh, and she does want to write her own book eventually. But Jiren, like Jiran J. Zhao um, is a New York Times bestselling author and she is the author of Iron Widow, I believe. Okay, which is hold like on. Very, yeah. Let's just read the names of the chapters because I think that's like going to be very mm -hmm. informative. Just I'm just was skimming those while you were talking. Right? So no, a short totally. a short summary of the scandal, why I rejoined Twitter and Kate Corain's promising star is the first chapter. Then she got sponsored. Yes. Epic and based. Love that. Um Suspicious Goodreads activity and how it all pointed to Kate. Subtweets, mm -hmm. group chats, and Kate's fake controversy with Lily. And I assume you're going to explain who that is. A bio yep. snake subplot. <laughs> Google yep. Docs of receipts and co-opting people of color. Boy, okay. Oh, jeez. Yeah, Surprising that there are consequences. Unsurprisingly, there's an incomplete... I don't know what that's going to finish to. Tweets that didn't age well and a plea of reasons for insecure authors. And then books by the targeted authors. Holy smokes. Okay. You may continue now. Yes. I feel like now that we have an idea what's going on here. Yes. So Kate Corain was on track to be a great, like, first debuted author. Um, they had gotten their first contract and they were doing a sci fi reimagining of, um, and what is it? Ariadne and Dionysus, like that Greek myth. Um, and uh, it was going to have a non-binary protagonist. So, you know, they got in with a major publisher. You know, they were on track to be a, you know, have a great career or at least a good start to it. Um, so like about a year prior to the books coming out, um, a bunch of like sock puppet good read accounts were made. And obviously like people didn't like perceive them as sock puppets at first but what these accounts all had in common is that they all had very ethnic names um yeah um i would be like or, a john smith type if i made a burner i don't have right? any burners like, before anyone makes any accusations but i yeah my burner would be like johnny appleseed you know what i'm saying like i would be very like i wouldn't i wouldn't name myself like chen something or you know or like yeah. anyway that's weird anyway continue well it's borderline digital black and yellow face at that point because i know that's what um like cindy talks about in her video as well and she she cracks some hilarious jokes like definitely watch that video it's so funny um but basically um the authors affected by this started getting like one star reviews and those authors are camilla cole francis white bethany baptiste whose book was just published a few days ago the poisons we drank uh, Molly X Chang, Akor Phoenix, KM Enright, and RM Virtues. So these are people who were all having their books published this year, right? So it's the whole 2024, or sorry, the 2024 roster of people who are getting published, right? So they all start getting one star reviews on their books. And these accounts are not like, this is just, it just goes to show you how fucking like dumb kate was being with this like like how fucking like stupid like stupid like not even like you're not even gonna be a diabolical villain about this like bro was liking their book and giving it five stars on the same accounts that they're downvoting the other authors that are a part of their publishing group 
How is that not so fucking obvious? You gotta right? throw a couple random John Grisham reviews in there or something, you know, to like yeah disguise like, it. I feel um, like right. So, um, you know, that was kind of just like a nothing burger for a bit. But like the thing is, because obviously, like people weren't. Um, these were books that were still about a year away from being published, so they weren't hot topics yet, right? Wait, how are it's you doing like good this- reviews on books that aren't out? You can do that on Goodreads because oh. people get advanced readers' copies. Well, okay. yeah, the that was also read- I've never used Goodreads in my life. I probably should have started with that. <laughs> well, this the other reason I wanted to talk about this too because it just goes to show how bad Goodreads platform is because you can really like you know overwhelm and create false reviews, right? And that can really mm-hmm. impact an author's debut. Uh, there, this isn't the first case, by the way, of an author spiraling and going into an absolute like. I wouldn't go as far to say mental health crisis because I don't want to speak on Kate Crane's behalf. But I mean, when we get to that part, the way that they are utilizing and weaponizing mental illness, you know, clearly they did have a mental episode here. But we could say PR spiral. This isn't the first time that authors have maybe engaged inappropriately or taken advantage of Goodreads. Like there was this one author a couple years ago that was so offended by a review that they've like doxxed and stalked the person that left it. And, like, had a vendetta against them for, like, two years. Yeah, like, Cindy even talked about in her video how she left a bad review. Or not even a bad review, just a moderate review. Three stars for a book for an author. And the author blocked them on, or blocked Cindy on uh, Twitter. Never interacted with her before. These people could never be YouTubers. Because I've had, like, phrenology comments. (laughs) Anyway, like, people were, like, yeah, trying to, like, deconstruct my facial features to figure out what my IQ is. When I talked about Sneeko. Yeah. Eugenics. That's the word. People were eugenicsing in my comments. And then it was funny because I was like, let me like see what they're talking about. And then I looked it up. And then according to their eugenics, I'm a genius. So I thought that was hilarious too. I'm like, you're not even doing it right. (laughs) But anyway, yeah. Like I found like some great, like some just absolutely like off the chain stuff. And I just like, block the comment and move on like people will be like yeah. deleted comments eh, bah, 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 in my comment section sometimes because well, youtube will filter them out you like, can't delete it on reads you know that's it's like it's a public review. yeah but it's like people will say that stuff and it's like i didn't even block their comment but then i'm like if i block them it's like okay it's it's my it's my channel i'll do what i want like no exactly right <laughs> like and these authors need to do is not like obsessively read over your good reviews and like like i remember how nervous i was to like post the first podcast back in a while and like i was worried about what the comments would say and then i was like you know going over them with you and i was like wow like totally like nothing to be anxious about so you know it just goes to like being an artist whether you're writing, creating content, sculpting, painting requires vulnerability and putting yourself out there and a willingness to try and be understood. And not everybody is going to understand you. And that's okay. Right? Like if they didn't like your book, that's okay. I think that's also why like some of like a lot of authors who are very, very famous are not on social media. Yeah. And that's why it's so bad that people like JK Rowling. Yeah. I was about about to be like, yeah. And then you got JK Rowling being like, man, your bag i'm i'm up. a turf and an anti-semite and cringe yeah. and my books the thing is too i think my favorite thing about that is like i i i read the first one harry potter and i was like this isn't even good and the way that i got torn up it was like 2013 and i was like i don't even like i was ahead of the wave i was like i don't even like this <laughs> i was like this is not <laughs> i never could get through the books but i liked the movies right mm, i and i didn't like the movies either I, I I liked the you know the theme of like dark academia right but like yeah I think we need we just need more of that genre and case in point like get white people out of the writing like the I actually chose not to go into publishing because the publishing industry is so predominantly white like I initially wanted to go into publishing but I knew so many people who a like deserve those positions more and b would be willing to work a lot harder than I would probably be because like internships are hard. You know, they're really hard. They're not always paying as well in Toronto. like Or nothing. And, or they pay nothing. Or they like pay mine. nothing. Like mine, yeah. It's yeah. It's funny because you say that with the white people in the, in the book space. And I have caused myself a detriment to my own academic pathway 
for how mm. I managed my undergraduate degree. Because my undergraduate degree, really? so University of Waterloo does what's called the British Literature Model, which means most of the books, most of the courses are based on classic British literature. Shakespeare, um, I always say Chaucer, and then people are like, you sing it wrong. I have a degree, leave me alone. And, <laughs> and then um, things like... The, uh, Oscar Wilde, the classics like that. There was a, a course yeah. on like Irish literature, medieval literature, things like that. And I did the exact minimum literature requirement for my degree. And then the rest, I did rhetoric courses. All right. And I did PC conflict studies. I did indigenous studies. I did because I didn't care about the one millionth white guy writing a book. I wanted something That's else. I am glad I went to TMU because my program director is a bi like, I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure if she's still the program director, but when I started university, Dr. Ann Leloy, biracial woman, and really took it upon, uh, like, they had been, like, decolonizing their department for quite a while before it even became, you know, a bigger conversation with, like, truth and reconciliation and, you know, Black Lives Matter. Like, they had already started to integrate courses, like, literature and film from Middle East, from the Middle East and North Africa. You know, they definitely have a very diverse curriculum and like variety of courses so it compared did, to other school yeah it did if you moved out I of literature it. right but then the issue was when i was trying to apply for masters of english mm -hmm. at mcgill they're like you don't have enough uh classic literature credit like you didn't study the stuff that we would do as an ma and i was like oh they said like you pretty much did like a pseudo communications degree based on what your class codes are. And I'm like, okay, mm -hmm. but I didn't write communications papers. I wrote literature papers or rhetoric papers, which are not the same. And they're like, well, we kind of no. don't care. So it's become very like <laughs> poor transferable. Like it's not transferable. Like my things are not moving around properly. It's becoming, uh, that's why I haven't been able to apply for uh, PhDs because it's been such a problem because they essentially are telling me I have to do a second MA in English if I want to do anything, but then no one will accept me for an MA in English because they're like, you didn't read enough medieval literature or whatever. And I'm like, okay, but I, I also know like what black people talk about in books. Like, is that not worthwhile? I've read things about like, I, yeah. I have a complex understanding of like indigenous education. Is that not worthwhile to you? I, I know how to like, I know like what restorative, I, I've, I've uh, done work in restorative justice. Is that not worthwhile to you? And it's not. And it's like the fact that I can't even like I've had to essentially ditch my literature background because I didn't read enough white people books. That's crazy. And it's because and it's something I never, ever realized would be an issue, you know, mm -hmm. and it has been a huge problem for me. It is making it's made it like essentially impossible. I've not been able to match be matched with a single person when applying for these degrees. It's like. Horrible. <laughs> So I completely get what you're getting at. Anyway, if you mind you. That's a, like they force you like the way that they divide up your mandatories too. like I wouldn't have been able to graduate without taking at least three to four um, historical English courses like they have 16th all the way to 20th century literature. Then they have modernity and romanticism as like two separate genre. But also like, you know, those are genres that have historical placement, right? Like it's not like. You can't point to like an era and be like, this is the romance era because romance has existed throughout mm -hmm, most mm -hmm. narrative throughout time. Right. But you can point to literature like uh, romantic capital R. And that's like, you know, 17th century, the sublime words worth all that jazz. You know, I paid a lot of money to know that. <laughs> yeah. But so circling back to Kate. Right. So like you're imagine you've got a book deal after going through the process of like either writing a book or like studying uh, literature and then writing a book i don't know what her background is as a student but just imagine writing a book i've never written a book you know you're then going behind the scenes and like doing these like sock puppets to try and undermine your colleagues right and also all of these colleagues are people of color these people who are publishing books that she was downvoting on goodreads which does affect somebody's debut was doing to people of color. I mean, and I, guess I had a burner and I'm commenting on yeah. like, on like Austin Green's videos or I'm, or I'm like tweeting about how much I hate Anna Marie Forcino or, oh. or like, like imagine I did that. Like imagine how wild that would be and how quickly and I'd be reprimanded too. Like, and widely like as a career, which I, oh, yeah. I, I, I would never do that. Right. 
like the most I say about someone in my space, like I say, when I've gotten a lot of questions about like Nick is not green, for example, is I'm like, it's not my type of stuff. It's none of my business. Uh, it's, you know, or like I have disengaged for this reason. And then I, re- even with like with Ethan earlier, I leave it very like on personal, if that, impersonal, I guess yeah. the word I'm looking for. And it's like, that's how it should be because it's like, we're all running for the bag. Like, and, and that's at the end of the day is what it boils down to. We live in like a capitalist it's society. Bureaucratic in a sense, right? Yeah. I don't want to call you a bureaucrat, but you know. No, but I know what you mean. Yeah, or diplomatic, I guess. Ooh. Anyway, so the other thing too that's also sinister is that she was trash talking an author that did a blurb for her for her book. Imagine if I asked you to like, you know, um, help me like film like a, a collab for a video I want to do in the future and then I'm like trash talking you on a burner like that's so crappy to do especially because like that friend is like a New York Times best-selling author as well or like a USA Today best-selling author so basically in the whisper networks of book Twitter and book talk people started like trying to figure out what was going on because you know especially for a lot of these authors they it was these were their debut books so um You know, I, you know, in contrast to other more seasoned authors, they're probably going to be checking their reviews a lot more frequently, right? Because it's their baby. It's their first book, right? It's kind of like, you know, when we posted our first podcast back, right? Like I was going to look at those comments. Yeah, small YouTubers will write full responses to every comment. I still try to respond to as many as humanly possible. But even I, someone who lasted way longer responding to every one of them than most people do, have now begun to lose the sauce, if you will, where I'm just like, oh, my God, you know, and I'm not even that popular. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they basically started comparing notes to these people and they were trying to get it handled behind the scenes. They didn't initially want it to come out. And one of the main people like driving this um, like investigation was Jiren J Jiren Zira what is it one of the main people driving this was Jiren J Zhao so the author of Iron Widow um and she has a second book coming out soon but she you know took I I too would take a look like I also if I was involved in the situation or had people involved in the situation I would be invested too like right out the gate because like this was crazy so they had started quickly like or sorry, quietly gathering receipts, like little things here and there to try and like piece together a timeline of like when these were taking place, from what accounts, you know, cross-referencing. They they were like, you know, getting receipts. So they were initially going to handle this behind the scenes and Jiren tweeted from her Twitter and was, you know, vaguing. She was like, you know, uh one would think that they'd come out on their own about this or apologize or make amends before we release this info. It's like when we were talking about Bada Panada or whatever, and I was like, that's it, I'm subtweeting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So she was like, uh, she, you know, Jiren was um, tweeting about that. And, uh, you know, I guess some other authors were tweeting as well. So I'll talk about that albino snake subplot, but I'll finish Kate's kind of like, timeline first so kate basically is probably scrambling behind the scenes because people are onto her or them you know she they use she they um so i believe all the details got leaked and then they had to scramble and come up with an apology and it's also worth noting too that a few months before this happening kate corain tried to make it seem like they were a victim of review bombing or like you know, they like tweeted and be like, oh, it looks like some people downvoted my book. Like, that's really awful to do to somebody who's going on their debut, like pot calling the kettle black, right? So, you know, now, you know, things come out. Book Twitter is kind of divided, but I would say 70% of people believe she did it. There's like a maybe 25, 30% that are a bit more skeptical or are waiting for more evidence because they're like, well, can we really prove that, you know, they did this because they didn't have IP addresses. Like when mm. everybody was on the creep show art yeah. thing, Emily Artful had IP addresses, yeah. right? Like she 
receipts. But they did not have any like IP addresses to confirm this. So it was a bit speculative. Well, yeah, because Kiwi right? Farms too will also outed her. Right? Because Kiwi Farms will out you if you're abused, which is. But that's because yep. it's Kiwi Farms, right? <laughs> um, oh, if only Kate would have used Kiwi Farms, they would have fucking wrapped this up in like half an they hour. They would have, but they also would have doxed her, which is not oh, ideal, Kiwi. obviously. Yeah. Um, or at least the IP yeah. address would probably would have come out, you know. But that's yeah. the thing. So basically, um, this started coming out and like Kate was scrambling. And so she initially like went to this Slack channel that had all these authors in there and, you know, sent them uh, she sent them like um, like a paste bin of screenshots from a discord chat. And she alleged that the accounts were not made by her. They were made by a friend of hers who was trying to, you know, um, defend her honor or like, you know, um, try and like shoot her friend to the top of the Goodreads list. Cause yeah. that's the thing. Goodreads has like an algorithm where they trend books that are getting talked about regardless of if it's negative or positive. But obviously, you know, she was trying to kind of like with Kiwi farms and creep show art was she was trying to like farm content farm for herself. Right. Yeah. Where she was like, Oh, look at this crappy video, you know? So she was doing that, but with her book. So, um, yeah, like she initially blamed it on a made up friend, um, that she called Lily. And she said, Oh, this is one of my fr friends from the Raylo fandom. And she's been, you know, a fan fiction person for years. And, and she went crazy and did all these things. And I didn't do it. I promise I didn't do it guys. And I'm a victim here too. And like a couple of Kate's friends who are authors, like maybe two or three were speaking out about it. One of them was, um, a person who has albinism and prior to this info about Kate coming out, uh, Bethany Baptiste, the author of, what was it, The Poisons? Yeah, anyways, Bethany Baptiste was unfortunately dragged into this. Um, and, you know, Cindy talks about the anti-blackness and, like, a lot of the colorism involved in how this happened. But basically, um, Bethany tweeted at, like, 6 a.m., like, oh, there's an albino snake in the grass, which is, like, a southern saying for um you know you've got like a suspicious white person like a white person you shouldn't trust right okay. and then four hours later is when some of the vague posting about kate happened right mm. and then a day or two later this author who has albinism was like you know it was very unbecoming of some people to make fun of others albinism because i have a disability and it makes you know and Yes, albinism is a disability. Yes, people shouldn't be making fun of albinism. That's not what she was talking about. And so, like, she inserted herself into this drama and started, like, derailing everybody's criticism from Kate Corain onto also, Bethany Baptiste. Also, like... Who is a disabled black woman, by the way. I was gonna say, so, like, like, I, I also hate when people bring up, like, a disability has nothing to do with anything. Like, it's like... It's like you, like, trashing people as a, on... Good reads or whatever, allegedly, hypothetically, in Minecraft has nothing to do yeah. with the fact that you're albino. Like, Good reads is not like the sun, you know, <laughs> and you're like well, getting a sunburn. Like, albino snake that she took personally. No, I was just say, like, but oh, I'm saying, me. like, you've done so yeah. much worse. It's like, it's like when people call me oh, fat, no, it's, it's like, not. do I hit them with, I have chronic asthma? Like, no, I just go, like, okay, you're cringe. Like, I don't know. It's just weird to, like, Sorry, I explained it wrong. This is um the person who has albinism is an author friend of Kate Corain. But oh, they were defending Okay. I see. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I thought Kate had yeah. okay, I mixed it up. That's my bad. No, no, no. No, it wasn't one of her burner accounts. Okay. Um but There's a lot of yeah, accounts so going on. I know. I, I honestly wanted to make like a whole like board with thread and string and stuff and like <laughs> hang it in my background. But I just did not have the time to do that um nor the investment because i didn't want to have to find a picture of kate corain and print it and put it on my wall hmm. um so yeah so basically what happens is um bethany baptiste unfortunately became the center of this and like you know it it really was very anti-black of because and like cindy points out in her video typical of white women to center themselves make the conversation that like it's like you said like nobody was talking about her like nobody was talking about her at all and she self-inserted to make herself the victim in a situation that did not involve her yep. while defending her happy friend right mm -hmm. and i believe her and bethany have since made up um like they've uh, like 
you know, they're, they're good. Cordial. Um, yes, they're yeah. cordial. They're not, they were never friends to begin with. Right. So, um, back to like Kate Corrine trying to scramble and cover her ass. She basically alleged that it was her Raylo friend that made all these puppet accounts. Right. Mm-hmm. The Raylos came with receipts because here's the thing <laughs> about the, here's the thing about the Raylo fandom. Um, Ray and Kylo Ren as characters didn't exist until 2017. So their entire fandom and con- concept as characters exists online. It's not like, you know, uh, Luke and Leia where they've existed since the 70s and like there's been how many zines, you know, fanfics over the years, things you couldn't track, right? Yeah. No. The Raylos, some of them went through a million tweets. I hate to say tweets. the most comparable thing I can think of is the Onceler girls on Tumblr. Where it's like that was fully yes. on the internet. Like the Onceler <laughs> stuff. Girl, we should <laughs> we should do the next I got comment. By a girl who scanned the Onceler. Comment can down below say- if the next episode is we pick our favorite Onceler fanfic and read it. Like we have <laughs> With heavy censorship, probably, because there's probably going to be some crazy sexual uh, stuff in there. But, like, I feel like we should do an episode where we pick a Onceler fan fiction. One of my really old videos that's privated now is that was actually me getting ready and I was reading a Donald Trump and Shrek fan fiction from Wattpad that I found. That's like a that's like in the I'll uh, I'll put a tiny clip in now of like me doing that it's from years ago it's like 2020 or something i guess it's private is it called make america swamp again no i'll well keep talking i'll find it i'll look at what it's uh what <laughs> what the because i think i linked the fan fiction in the uh description but continue <laughs> A place where we can go shrek said at the place where shrek suggested Pepe the Frog was there, John Cena, Doge, and Snoop Dogg. Okay, like, I know this is, like, obviously extremely satirical and not even, like, it's, like, a fan fiction for the site, for the sake of writing fan fiction. Not, like, you know, doesn't have, like, the passion of, like, the Harry Potter fan fictions or whatever. But, like, usually those have, like, impeccable writing quality. And this one's just, like, bringing me pain. Um, I'm going to edit out all my pauses, but trying to, like, figure out what the sentences are saying is causing me emotional distress. Donald was very happy to see Pepe wearing a My Chemical Romance shirt. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, I am... Incredible. Um, yeah, I should probably... I'm going to wrap this up because... So you need basically, to go, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, basically, um, people quickly realized because you know a lot of people know how to Photoshop better than Kate Corain that she had Photoshopped those Discord messages. Like mm. she, po- so she basically sent a bunch of fake screenshots to a Slack channel where the authors who were affected had been talking about this, and she was trying to defend herself and apologize and was like, "I'm, I know we don't know each other personally, but I hope you wouldn't think." Or assume negative intent in me, and it's like, okay, way to way to like spin this and make it seem like if they assume ill intent in you, they're the bad people. Like, especially when they're people of color too. Like, screw off. So she, yeah, she her messages were like Kate Corain X O Kitty Girl sent at like today at 10 p.m. And then this so called Lily person she was messaging was like responded yesterday and it was like today yesterday today yesterday so she didn't even photoshop the receipts that she made up i well found the fan fiction oh my god what's it it's called? called just call me daddy donald oh. trump x shrek and there's there's like chapters called like blood on the dance floor there's like a yeah michael sarah's in there so basically what happened was the Raylos came to court and were like, this Lily person has never existed in the history of our fandom. We went through millions of tweets and there are no tweets from an account or from any girl named Lily. And I, I kind of rolled my eyes at that. I'm like, you're telling me there's not a single girl on planet earth named Lily who likes Raylo. Like that's a bit of a stretch, but clearly there wasn't like a present enough one 
to like I rolled my eyes a little at that like not at Kate and yeah. like the allegations of Kate I just thought that that was a very silly base to like you know mount your argument on right I just was like okay that is a very silly you know not entirely like empirical way of measuring that but regardless once they found that it was photoshopped like uh then like Kate like scrambled. everything gets thrown out yeah everything gets thrown out so she was scrambling and tried to come up with other answers and her other answer was oh I am autistic and have ADHD and was on my meds and spiraling and that's when I made all these accounts over the course of a year and was sock puppet like hating on all of these people of color and the fucked up thing to Mika why is do that white people it- think autism makes you racist like this happens way I too know. often like I'm tired of it. I'm tired of, I'm also tired of like white people. And like Cindy talks about this too in her video, like um, using their queerness and their neurodivergency as an excuse. It's a or, joke like, sound on TikTok. <laughs> yeah. Like I'm, like, I am, I am a uh, bisexual neurodivergent. It's like a joke, right? Where it's like yeah. immediate. Yeah. Deflection. Yeah. That's ridiculous. Yeah. No, it's because it's like they'll use it for social capital when it's like to leverage over people of color or other marginalized groups. Um, but like they also use it as a defense for when they're called out for being racist or homophobic. Or like, like unless you're in like a schizophrenic psychosis. Yeah. OK. And before, again, people I've actually li- like I've seen this happen to people. You have the capacity to understand like basic societal norms and, and what's appropriate like, unless you're that far gone, which is in the case of, like, my friend, for example, quite literally thought we all died and it was hell and he had to save us. You have, you can grasp that that um, you shouldn't pretend to be a gay black person in a Goodreads uh, comment section. You know, like, it's pretty, no, exactly. that's, like, pretty obvious. Like, it's a... She's also, like, having this cognitive dissonance in the conversation with herself when she's, like, writing these fake screenshots where... She pretends to be Lily and Lily's like, oh, yeah, I just remembered, by the way, on all those accounts I made, uh, they're all people of color. So now everyone's going to think you're racist. Ha ha ha. And like, bro, like the call is coming from inside the house. And you're probably, and house- yeah, most people aren't going to message that directly to, you know, what I mean, be like, <laughs> this is going to make leftist Twitter mad. Like that's like nobody, nobody talks like that in real life. Right. Like nobody talks about that. Like. Okay. Or nobody talks like that. But anyways, um, yeah, Kate Corrine left the internet, tr- pseudo apologized and was like, sorry, yeah. I did it because I'm neurodivergent and a minor. Uh, not, like, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's it though, but that's the one, yeah. neurodivergent and a minor, yeah. Literally. And then um, the reason why I wanted to talk about this too is because she recently came back two or three weeks ago doing like, um, like an article and in an interview with somebody to try and like, you know, fix the PR of her career. Cause this is the thing. She lost her agent. She lost her book deal. She lost like most of her professional friends in the industry. She's been in New York times, like Chicago sun. Like she's been in all the tabloids, like since December when this happened. Right. Um, so she was trying to like fix this and do a little PR band aid. And literally in the freaking interview, she blames it on her neurodivergence again. And like on be on her SSRIs. And it's like, I just truly hate the vilification. I took of- Lexapro. All it did was make me, all it did was make me gain 30 pounds, girl. Like, that's all it did. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, like, and, and, and silence the voices a little bit, you know? Like, that's all, that's all uh, uh, SSRI. Because the thing is, too, that what makes that so mm-hmm. stupid, because real recognize real in this regard, SSRIs mm-hmm. have no, like, complex, like, um, psychosomatic effects like that. Like, that's why you no. don't get high off of them. It's not like she's like, I did uh, uh, a full bar of Xanax and then did that, where there's a possible, well, or like three like Benadryls, you know what I mean? It's not the same. Yeah. Like, Lexapro isn't, or, or, or Zoloft or, or, or Prozac or whatever, it doesn't actually change your, like, besides like suicidal ideations, which is something that happens to people, it doesn't really mm-hmm. like, Make you think weird things that don't really exist. That's not the nature of that medication. Obviously, like if someone in the comments is more aware than I am, but to my understanding, because when when they give you like the pamphlets and stuff when you're taking Lexapro, for example, it's like it doesn't do that. It's not a, a hallucinogen. It's not a psychedelic. It's not anything like that. It's not even an amphetamine like Vyvanse. 
You know? No, it's not. It's like you picked the worst one to blame it on if you're picking SSRIs. Because also the thing is, too, SSRIs take months to work to their full extent, Mm -hmm. too, right? So it's like, and months to wear off. Like, I remember for me, it's like my body didn't regulate off of Lexapro for six months before, like, everything re-regulated like like um cycles um, and and uh, well my appetite never came back too which is like a whole other thing but that's besides the point so it's just that's so funny because it's like you even picked the worst which is epic no, seriously. you need to go to work so we're gonna wrap up really quick to conclude epic l socials will be in the description my socials are in the description my makeup is oh my god because you're on the ipad <laughs> I love I didn't realize it did that outside of like FaceTime because he hit this right it does the balloons but oh my god (laughs) what's on my face will be in the description here are a couple of chapters from that Shrek fan fiction it got updated for five years by the way from 2015 to 2020 uh Shrek emo question mark part three uh down with the swamp Pepe saves the day. My Shrek spoon. Daddy sh- issues part two. Dara's kinky story. Daddy issues part three. Finishing my homework. Daddy issues four. A rough time. Daddy issues five. Parental guidance. Daddy issues part six. In incoming and then C H censor D E. Daddy issues seven. Parentheses Trump's tower. Shrek and Donnie. And then the last chapter just called "Okay, Okay, Okay," with, a th- with an ellipses. So there's a lot of really epic. Uh, I remember this being really funny too. But <laughs> let us know in the description or the, in the com- excuse me in the comments if we're doing the once learn next uh, or any other topics in general that you would like. Links, sources, all that stuff. Well, I that's my habit of doing that. There's no sources here. We're not well. Actually, no, there are. You have your, the video. We'll put the video in the description. Then I'll yeah, put. Yeah. Uh, Video. I'll put Finster's uh, coming out video too as well. And I'll put uh, Paige Christie's Ethan Klein video also in the description because we talked about that. So there will be sorts. Never mind. Epic. Anyway, <laughs> you kids have an amazing day. And we'll see you when we see you. Bye. Oh, Marlin. Guess who just escaped the